Let's take our Bibles at this time and turn to the Gospel according to Matthew, chapter 2. In the last section, that's all we'll read for now of the Bible. We'll be reading and referring to other passages, but here, 19 through 23, the last of the events recorded in Matthew with regard to the infant child, the holy infant child, Jesus. Hear God speak to us, Matthew 2, verse 19 through 23. Now when Herod was dead, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared in a dream to Joseph in Egypt, saying, Arise, take the young child and his mother, and go to the land of Israel, for those who sought the young child's life are dead. And he arose and took the young child and his mother and came into the land of Israel. But when he heard that Archelaus was reigning over Judea instead of his father Herod, he was afraid to go there, and being warned by God in a dream, he turned aside into the region of Galilee, and he came and dwelt in a city called Nazareth, that it might be fulfilled which was spoken by the prophets, he shall be called a Nazarene. As far we read God's word, and as we've been noting in Matthew, God has been saying a lot in Matthew, and he's been saying a lot in fulfillment of Old Testament things that he had already spoken, but which were realized in their ultimate reality in Jesus Christ. In fact, there's four events here recorded of the infant life of Jesus, and this is a, the testimony of the scripture here, a record of all that God predicted with regard to these events. We've seen that in the Old Testament, there's fulfillment of one prophecy after another here. So when the Magi come and they find that uh, Jesus is born, the King of the Jews, and they ask, where should he be born? The Jews themselves, knowing scripture, Quote Micah chapter 5 and verse 2, that out of Bethlehem would come the ruler and the shepherd of the people Israel. Herod wants to find him. The wise men go a different way. And we're told that Jesus or Joseph was warned uh, to leave the country. And Joseph heeds the warning. And that's to fulfill the prophet Hosea, who spoke of Israel being called out of Egypt, and this is fulfilled in Jesus, who goes down there and then is called back. We've seen as well that in this morning, the prophet Jeremiah has a voice here. He's the, the voice of Rachel in Jeremiah 31 in verse 15. That's fulfilled in the lament of the mothers in Israel who were grieved inconsolably at the slaughter of the infants by Herod. And now we read of another event <clears throat> in uh, the taking of Jesus to Nazareth, and that too is said to come to pass to be fulfilled what was spoken by the prophets that Jesus would be called a Nazarene. So there's a lot going on here, and there's a lot of speech here of God, Old Testament and New Testament. In fact, the canonical significance of Matthew, the whole book, is that there's a record in Matthew of things fulfilled by Jesus. He's the Jewish writer who writes for Jews to say to them that Jesus is no novelty, but he's what God has said in the Old Testament, the fulfillment of, him, uh, of, of prophecy is in him. And that's the thing to remember as we consider the last event here and the last fulfillment of prophecy he shall be called a Nazarene. Jesus is the word of God. And therefore, these words of the Old Testament are fulfilled. The fulfillment of things in the New Testament is not Jesus simply going around or being led around, Joseph going around, because they know, well, this has to happen. He has to be born in Bethlehem, so we're quick going to go there and then it will be fulfilled because, well, we knew about it and we brought him there. No. Jesus is the word that God has always spoken, and therefore these things are fulfilled in him. 
it's not kind of a, a game that's being played here so that everything lines up with the Old Testament. Rather, it's simply God saying things naturally as God, what he's always said, one thing of his son, and when events occur according to the sovereign hand of God, and you find that there is fulfillment, not by chance, and not by people playing games and trying to get things fulfilled, but simply because God is in control here, as he always has been. What often happens, always happens, I should say, when God speaks, people listen. And people listen, and they're either for or again what God would say. And as we've seen here, there's beings who are for or against what God would say and fulfill in Jesus. We have God here who's superintending the whole process and all of these events of his Holy Son, and he's for Jesus. Agree with that? God is for Jesus, of course. He's his eternally begotten Son whom he sends out of his love for his Son and for his people in him, and he's showing his love for him. Angels as well, servants of the Lord, are here left and right, and they always are in the events that concern the Son of God, uh, caring for Jesus not only, but caring that the salvation that God has ordained might be fulfilled in him for many sons to follow. So God and the angels, of course, they're for Jesus, but there is a whole other class of beings who are against what God says in Jesus and against, therefore, the things being fulfilled in Jesus in these events. We've seen that Herod leads the way as that great monster, that moral, complete moral monster who has uh, no qualms about killing off babies who might be a threat to his throne. This is in keeping with his character and is also in keeping with the devil, whom he represents and serves as one of his minions. But then there's this question that has been raised and should concern us as we consider Matthew, and that's the Jews. Remember when the Jews were apprised by Herod that there's these wise men here and they're asking where the king of the Jews is? And the Jews give this great answer, a biblical answer. He comes out of, out of Bethlehem. Micah says so. They're so orthodox. But the problem is the Jews are just troubled by this. They're troubled maybe because Herod's troubled. They know his character. They know what he's going to do. He's going to put down this threat. And this could cause social upheaval. But they're only troubled. They do not heed the word of God through the Magi here and lead the way in going to see the babe and to worship him. They are those, in fact, who themselves would show themselves to be the ones who would crucify Jesus. And this is exactly because of the fulfillment of the words of the prophets in our text, that Jesus is of Nazareth. And that's what we want to consider tonight, the prophecy of Jesus, who's born, or not born in Nazareth, but who's raised in Nazareth, who's from there, and how this was something that fulfilled the prophets, that he should be called a Nazarene. This, I say, is one of the ways that the Jews find something against Jesus, and so they would crucify him. But God is speaking here, and let us hear the word. Every single one of us here, let's hear the word and ask ourselves the question, in light of the form we read for preparatory, in light of whatever we know when we hear the word of God, are we going to believe, or are we going to reject these words? We're going to take it to heart what God says in Jesus being a Nazarene. Or are we going to say, well, this is just proof that he's not much and he's not worthy of our devotion. Are you for or are you again the son of God? He's the Nazarene. That's what we want to consider first of all. And then we want to consider the followers who were called in the book of Acts of that sect of the Nazarene, a term of reproach. Then we want to consider the fruit of that Nazarene and those Nazarenes 
of God's work in the church. There's a question that comes to mind, a very important question. When the Bible says that Jesus came and dwelt in a city called Nazareth, and Joseph did and the child with him, that it was that it might be fulfilled which is spoken by the prophets, he shall be called a Nazarene. The question is, <clears throat> what prophets are mentioned here? What prophecy? In fact, in the Bible, in the Old Testament, not once is Nazareth itself mentioned, and there's no one text that speaks of Jesus being called a Nazarene, or the Messiah being called a Nazarene, uh, namely one of Nazareth. So there's a question here. But some have said, well, that proves that the Bible isn't infallible here, and Matthew's mistaken. We write that off as something that's of unbelief. Matthew's not mistaken. The fact is, note here, he says that there's something that the prophets, plural, have said, and that the prophets still do say in the Old Testament that he shall be called a Nazarene. Not just one prophecy, like Jeremiah, Jeremiah is quoted, the prophet, in verse 17 and 18 as saying something, and we can find that in Jeremiah 31. It's not that. There is this prophet Hosea saying, out of Egypt I called my son, and you can find it in Hosea chapter 11. It's not here that Micah is cited, verse 5, thus it's written by the prophet Micah, but you Bethlehem in the land of Judah, and not the least in the rulers of, Ju of Judea, and so on, uh, but these are prophets that are cited here. And that, I think, is the answer to how we ought to understand the fulfillment of Scripture here in Jesus being from Nazareth and known as being from Nazareth and called, therefore, one of the inhabitants of Nazareth and Nazarene. It's simply this, that there is a testimony of more than one prophet, perhaps even several prophets, of something about the identity of this Jesus and his origin and even his purpose, that he shall be called a Nazarene. There's something about him that's being identified here by the powerful testimony of more than just one prophet. In fact, it could be, and this is what I want to uh, point out to you, three things here, that Nazarene is a reference to Jesus being what in the Old Testament is called a Nazare. And you see the, the uh, semblance between Nazarene and Nazare. And Nazare in the Hebrew language referred to what's called the branch in Old Testament prophecies. The branch was not just one prophet speaking of the branch, but several of the prophets spoke of a Nazare. And it could be that Matthew was picking up on that and saying that his being from Nazareth is a reminder that he is indeed the Nazare, or what the prophets, plural, called the branch. I'm referring to these passages such as Isaiah chapter 11, first of all. You can follow me if you want. There shall come forth a rod from the stem of Jesse, David's father, and a branch or a twig shall grow forth from that stem or stump of Jesse, shall grow out of his roots. And this is clearly the Messiah, this branch or twig that comes out of this cut-down stump of the line of Jesse. And the Spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him, the spirit of wisdom and understanding, the spirit of counsel and might, the spirit of knowledge, and of the fear of the Lord, his delight is in the fear of the Lord, and so on. Clearly, this is a reference to Messiah. It could very well be that Nazareth refers to Nazar. And I want to point out to you that in the Bible and the Old Testament, there were no vowels as we know them. They were written in later for understanding by the Masoretic scholars. But since there were no vowels, the three principal letters of a Nazare were N, Z, and R. 
Do you find how that's similar to Nazareth? Not Ser, Nazareth. Jeremiah is another prophet that speaks of Jesus as the branch, or the Messiah as the branch. Behold, the days are coming, Jeremiah 23, 5 says the Lord that I will raise to David a branch of righteousness, a king shall reign and prosper and execute judgment and righteousness in the earth. In his days, Judah will be saved and Israel will dwell safely. Now this is his name by which he will be called the Lord our righteousness, Yahweh Tzith Kenu, as the poem goes, the Lord our righteousness, this is Messiah. So there's a reference Very well may be, and scholars are disagreed on this. I cannot be exactly dogmatic, but certainly this is biblical. When Jesus goes to Nazareth, there's something that is to be um, known of Jesus by his very location, and that he's the one who comes, and his origin is not what you expect, his beginning, where he comes from. He's just a stem out of this line of Jesse that's all but killed off in Mary and Joseph and so on, and so that there's like no hope left in Israel. The Old Testament prophets remind us that though there is this stump left in the line of the kings, David, and therefore this little chance of the fulfillment of the promise, yet there is in God's mind, in his prophecy, this true hope that there is a stem or a branch, a little twig that comes out of this stock of Jesse, he's still there, and he's going to grow out of the nothing into something, even the Messiah, the branch who is the Lord our righteousness. So of his origin, this is why there may be this testimony that is surely of the prophets. He shall be called Nazarene, he shall be branch-like, and his being born in Nazareth is all to remind us of the Natser, the Natser of David's line. That's one possibility. It's certainly a biblical concept that Jesus is this branch, this Natser. The second has to do with the location of Nazareth itself, and this is the favored Uh, understanding of this fulfillment of the prophets. Nazareth was in Galilee, north of Judea, about 55 miles far away from things of renown in the history of Judea, Jerusalem, Bethlehem. They were not there. Could be that's why Joseph himself, when he came back to uh, to Palestine at the he was, he was told he could go back because those who sought his life were dead. When he came back, he might have lingered around Judea and Bethlehem even, not just because he had friends, but because he knew that this son of Mary was a special child. He knew the name of this child, Jesus, who would save his people from their sins. Emmanuel was his title, God with us. And surely he would have thought, to Joseph, that I should stick around here in Bethlehem's environs and, and also near Jerusalem, and certainly my son is going to do great things. And this isn't just proud, uh, pride about this foster son of his, but there's something of faith here, I find. Well, be that as it may, remember the text says he's warned not to stay in this land. There is a problem, he says, And um, he had heard that Archelaus was reigning. That's the son of Herod, a wicked man as well. And even though he's trying to stay as much as he could near Bethlehem, it seems that he must be warned by God. No, no, you can't do that. You have to go, and you got to go far away and even into Galilee. And so that's where Joseph ends up. And in fact, lo and behold, this is the place where he and Mary had themselves lived before Jesus was taken to Bethlehem, so they find themselves in that place. And the point I want to make is is that this Nazareth was despised by the Jews as a place of no account. Could have been that there was a Roman garrison there, and that's why they didn't like it. Simply could have been that Galilee was a place of Gentiles. There were Gentiles who inhabited the land, and the Jews 
the more orthodox, the right wing, as it were, of the religion of the Jews were those who gathered around Jerusalem and Judea, and nothing good would come out of Nazareth. In fact, that's what they would say. Nathaniel would say in chapter 1 of, uh, of John, in verse 46, Nathaniel said, Can anything good come out of Nazareth? And Philip had to say to him, Come and see. And later on, we read of the Jews in chapter 7 uh, berating Nazareth or, or Christ because they said, Will the Christ come out of Galilee? Verse 41 of John 7. In verse 52, are you also from Galilee? They say to Nicodemus, search and look, for no prophet has risen out of Galilee. So Nazareth was in Galilee, and surely that was a place of, of irrepute. It just wasn't worthy of the attention of those who looked for great prophets to arise in the annals of the history of the Jews. And so... Nazareth was held in a kind of contempt, and anyone who came from that place was, was called a contemptible Nazarene. And this is, is striking, as we'll see later, the disciples were called that sect of the Nazarenes. But this is because, first of all, their master, their leader, their savior, Jesus, was from Nazareth, and he was held in contempt by the Jews. Nothing good can come out of Nazareth. And they used that as a justification for not listening to him. Well, as commentators agree, and yours truly as well, who would bring this word to you, there's certainly the gospel here of the nature of Jesus. If his perhaps being alluded to as the branch is a comment on his origin, that he comes out of Jess's stump and is hardly anything, the location of Jesus' upbringing, Nazareth, is a reflection on his character. He's a nothing sort of person in the eyes of the Jews and of ordinary people. He not only has no form that we should desire him, but he also has no reputation of a man who is to be desired, even from his very location. And certainly fraternizing with the Galileans and the Gentiles wouldn't do him well. And being of a lowly carpenter's household, what, what good could he amount to? And this, therefore, could be how the prophets are being fulfilled in his being of that place, Nazareth, and having this character of lowliness and contemptibility. People would look down the nose at him, and he wouldn't be of much account. And I'm referring to the testimony of not just one or two prophets, but of a whole slew of prophets who say the same thing. And that's why, that's why verse 23 might be in the plural, the prophets. All of the prophets say this of Jesus. He's just someone who's going to be called a Nazarene. He's, he's not much. In fact, he's contemptible, and he's not much in the eyes of the people. Psalm 22, 6 and 7. But I am a worm and no man. Jesus says, A reproach of men and despised by the people. All those who see me ridicule me. They shoot out the lip. They shake the head, saying, He trusted in the Lord. Let him rescue him. Let him deliver him, since he delights in him. But you are he who took me out of the womb. You made me trust while on my mother's breast. I, ca I was cast upon you from birth from my mother's womb. You've been my God. Be not far from me, for trouble is near. The reproachers are near. The ones who would deny that I'm the speech of God are near. They'd contradict me. I'm feeling the pain. There's none to help. Isaiah 53, another outstanding passage speaking of the nature of Christ as a kind of a Nazarene who has believed our report to whom is the arm of the Lord revealed. For he shall grow up before him as a tender plant, as a root out of dry ground, reference to the branch. He has no form, no comeliness, and when we see him, there's no beauty that we should desire him. He's despised and rejected of men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief, and we hid, as it were, our faces from him. He was despised, and we did not dis esteem him. 
There's certainly something here that's alluded to in the fulfillment of the prophets, all of which speak of this lowliness of Jesus, this contemptibility. And so he's called a Nazarene. It's like a name they give him. Even as people would give to Corinthians, they'd say, well, that's a Corinthian thing to do. To Corinthianize was to commit lust, the lust of the Corinthians. And the church had to bear that reproach. Even in the name of Christ, they were called Corinthians. And so Jesus was called, he was labeled a Nazarene, a nothing, a no man, a nothing man, not God's man. We should not listen to him or to God through him. So with regard to his origin, certainly this going to Nazareth has something to say. With regard to his place of upbringing, where the very inhabitants would reject him, as we read in Luke 4, they'd, cast him, they'd seek to cast him off the cliff. There's something of the littleness, the despicableness, the contemptibility of Messiah that's brought out. So you see here, it's not just Herod who's going after Jesus. It'll be all the Jews. It'll be all of those who look for great things among men so that great men can save other great men who are looking for a religion where God comes to call the righteous and where the righteous have no need of repentance and no need of a, of a cross. They have no place for a Nazarene. I suppose they were looking for someone from Hollywood or some other such famous place, Jerusalem, and a place of the repute that they could see was a reputable place. So those two things, at least. There's one other, and I submit this to you for your contemplation. Again, not to be... Uh, 100% dogmatic about this. But I do want to suggest to you there's something here of Jesus' consecration here, his being set aside by God in every respect. He's being taken to Egypt, and brought back. He's being taken now to Nazareth. It points to him as the ultimate fulfillment of everyone who's ever been consecrated to God. And specifically, this would be to the priests. He's revealed here in, in different ways as a priest, but also to that special one who was consecrated as a Nazarite. Now, I know most of us have learned Jesus is called a Nazarene here, not a Nazarite. Don't confuse the two. And I understand that. I understand also that Jesus did not fulfill the requirements of Nazarites. So if you look in Nazar uh, Numbers chapter 6, the requirements of a Nazarite, you find that Jesus certainly wasn't your normal Nazarite. Remember what a Nazarite was like? Well, he's like John the Baptist, the forerunner of Jesus. Couldn't eat, drink strong drink, wine. Couldn't touch a dead body lest he defile himself. And couldn't cut his hair. Well... We don't know about the hair part of Jesus, but we do know that he dwelt or he was among those who drank wine. He made water into wine, seemed to have no problem with wine. He was called a wine bibber by the Jews. And that he certainly touched dead bodies when he raised them from the dead. So there's nothing outwardly that showed Jesus to be a Nazarite in the technical sense of the word. We find here, though, in contemplating this and in light of the rest of the Bible and how Jesus fulfills all things in the Bible, that there's the ultimate one who's dedicated to God here, even though he's brought here to Nazareth. He doesn't consciously go here and make himself, say, a Nazarite, but he's brought to this place to remind people that this one will be all about the business of his father. Certainly he'll show that later on when he's a young lad at 12 and he's in the temple. I'm about my father's business and all of his life. 
He's doing the things that priests were to do, serve God. That's what priests were to do, according to Leviticus. And also Nazarites. Nazarites, by their vow and by their, the outward appearance of things, were not to partake of things of this earth and things that they could rest in and rejoice in, like a glass of wine at the end of the day, because they were on a mission. And the mission was to be set aside from anything earthly and anything that would hinder their mission and their focus until the vow was performed. They had work to do. Now the reason why I suggest to you that there is some kind of awesome and spiritual fulfillment in Jesus being Nazarite is because, again, that word Nazareth is very similar to the word Nazarite. In fact, similar and more similar to the Nazarite of number six is the Nazarite that Samson was called in the Judges, chapter 13, verse 5, Nazaros, Nazaros. And so those syllables again, those consonants, N, Z, R, stand out. And, and Samson, we know, was this Nazarite, and when he broke his vow, he had no power. But he was dedicated to the service of God, and he was on the mission of a holy war for God. Now, certainly this is Jesus. And certainly the substance and the essence and the spiritual fulfillment of everything a Nazarite and a priest, very similar, were about, is in Jesus. And I find here in this being taken to Nazareth, his being one who was at the very beginning dedicated to the service of God. It could even be the fact that there were priests, families of priests who were located in Nazareth, a little known fact, who would come down to Jerusalem and they would do the service of the temple after their course. There were different priests who would be located in at least around Nazareth and they would come down and be priests. But Jesus himself, if he was a Nazarite, okay, and I'll grant you that, there's a question about this, was an invisible Nazarite. He was not one that would be noted for being a Nazarite. In fact, his reputation was he was of the devil. He so turned the tables upside down when he went into the temple. He so did things that were unnatural for a Nazarite who would show himself to be consecrated to God by getting into trouble with everybody left and right that it just doesn't seem that he would be this holy man of God. It's striking. Jesus realized this. He didn't come to be, in, to be seen and to impress people by his habits, his dietary habits, or his visage. He came simply to serve God. But it's only at the end of his life. In Matthew 26, we read of this. Right after he's instituted the supper, that he says, now I'm going to show you what I'm all about. In Matthew 26, 29, he says, Now I will not drink wine until we enter the kingdom together. And he refuses wine on the cross. Now he says, you're going to see what I'm all about. But my Nazaritic vow, whatever you want to say it is, my consecration to God, because I'm his word, and I love him, and he loves me, is that I'm going to the cross, and I will not... Let anyone detract from my mission, and I tell you, as I go to the cross, I will drink to the dregs the cup of the wrath of God, and nothing of this world, nothing of this world will I enjoy as long as I've not atoned for the sins of my people. Certainly he is one who in the fullness of every word, consecration and priesthood, Nazarite is the reality, what God would say. This is who Jesus is. From his origin, his nature, lowly nature, to his mission, to his purpose in life. It's all about God. So we're being readied for Matthew 3, Matthew 4, Matthew 5, the earthly ministry, the public ministry of Jesus. 
And all in this final fulfillment of these words of the prophets, not written on the subway walls and tenement halls, but in the word of God, we're ready for Jesus. That's what Matthew's been saying. This is the kind of God we have. And he wants at every point of the, word, of, of the way that we understand this is his word and follow him and be willing to be called a Nazarene and be willing to glory in him. And this is what the apostles did. It's striking. Most held Jesus in contempt. He's from Nazareth. What a lowly beginning. In fact, we suspect he's just a bastard. We suspect he's from Belial. That's why he casts out devils. We suspect he's from hell. And his being of Nazareth shows us that he's not much and even worse because he, he's a pretender. But then there's some, and there's some even today, who glory in the name. Look what Peter did when he had healed by the power of the risen Lord Jesus. And he was brought before the Pharisees, the Sanhedrin. Let it be known to you all, he says, and to all the people of Israel, that by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth in your face, whom you crucified, whom God raised from the dead, by him of Nazareth, this man stands here before you whole. By him, who's the branch. By him who never sinned. By him who takes away sin. I heal. I do my ministry. Later on, Apostle Paul would remind those before whom he was hailed that Jesus of Nazareth appeared to him on the way to Damascus. And though the disciples are called forth before the judges, that sect of the Nazarenes, they held their heads, they held their heads high. They were not ashamed to be calling the sect of the Nazarenes, even as they weren't ashamed of being called Christians, seemed to be a term of reproach. What about us today? What about us as we leave Christmas presently and think upon the whole life and ministry of Jesus Christ? What about us when they say to us, you're not of much? Where are you from? You're not from Harvard. You don't have a degree. You're just a simple farmer or a bricklayer or a businessman or this or that. And your message, that's contemptible. It puts us all in a bad spot, in a bad light. There's no rights, according to this message of the gospel, except the rights of God and the righteousness of Christ, you're saying. But Jesus, don't we read in these pages, don't we hear God say, he wasn't much. And he was a helpless babe. Don't we hear that? And, and what did the religious leader of the day say? And certainly they knew. They knew their Torah. What did the experts say of Jesus? He just died. And his disciples said he was risen, but we know they lied. And they worked themselves up. So we have this thing called Christianity and people wanting to follow Jesus all over the place. But it's just people following a sectarian sort of person who everywhere he went spoke and it was divisive. And we know too, you preacher, you church, you Christian, you, you're just seeking to make trouble because you're calling all men by your words to repent and to believe in Jesus Christ. And look what, look what Peter goes on to say of this one of Nazareth. He goes on to say, this is the stone which is rejected by you builders, this Jesus of Nazareth, which has become the chief cornerstone, nor is there salvation in any other, for there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. Jesus 
is exalted here by Peter. It's the only way and the truth and the life. From Nazareth, mind you, according to the prophets and the prophesyings of the prophets that he will be of no account. Be ready. He's not going to be this glam man, this glad-handing man. He's going to be God's righteous man. And he's going to die for his cause, which is sinners. And he's going to drink the cup. And he's going to win. That's the gospel we preach. And if we would show ourselves for this gospel and for this son, who, by the way, in Matthew 2, hasn't done anything yet. He's just carried around. He's just hanging from mother's breast. He's this helpless babe. But God has done things. God is fulfilling prophecy with regard to him, his word. And God is caring. That leads finally to this final point. The purpose, the fruit of Jesus' ministry and the church now, today. The church which sorrows over sin, but not inconsolably. We don't just read the first part of Psalm 77 or Psalm 42. We don't just lament at all the terrible things in the earth, but we rejoice in Jesus, that church, that church has one goal and there's one principal fruit of the ministry of Jesus of Nazareth. According to the prophets, it's this. All the glory is given to God. That's it. What Jesus being of Nazareth proves and all the prophets have prophesied before him and all the church afterwards says is that he who would glory, let him glory in God and in this thing called grace and this thing called the gospel, the good news that God saves sinners. People of God, don't come away from this word spoken in Matthew 2 without that on your mind. Not many mighty, not many wise, not many rich and famous of the world are called, but the lowly, because we follow the lowly Jesus all the way to the cross, all the way in the path of obedience and discipleship and gladness in our consecration to him, though it be a cross we bear. And everything, even the world, we must give up until we get to heaven. Are you in? Are you for? Do you hear the word? Believe. Amen. We thank you, Father, for the word of God that you speak. You remind us of your way when you bring Jesus to Nazareth. You remind us of his origination, of his nature, of his purpose, and that this has become ours. And people ask where we're from, why should we believe you? And all we have to say is, we just came from Adam but now we're from heaven by the grace of God. And they say, what's your mission? And we say, it's to call sinners to repentance. And they, they say, Lord, they don't like it. But we say, it's just true. It's the only way that people are saved. When they believe in someone not themselves. In someone not from Hollywood. In someone not from the institutions of the land that produce great men. But someone from heaven who came as born in Bethlehem, laid in a manger, taken out to Egypt and called out, and then to Nazareth, to be rejected among men, but accepted as the beloved Son of God, by God himself, and by many who are graced. In Jesus' precious name we pray, amen.